there are going to be some times when my understanding, the things I think I know and that I've learned and the questions that I'm asking outpaces the faith that I have. That's an angsty thing. I do not like living sure, yeah. in that space. I ask for the faith to kind of catch up to my understanding. And then there are times when my faith like outpaces my understanding and the things that I know and the, the questions that I have. And in those times, I ask for wisdom to live out the faith that I have and to keep learning more and growing into maturity and so forth. I think we would all be better off if we just expect that to be a normal part of the ways that we interact with the Bible. Hey everyone, welcome to The Walk Podcast. We want this to be a place where we can answer honest questions, talk about hard issues, and walk alongside one another as we explore how spirituality fits into real life. I'm Gil, I'm your host, and today we're talking to a good friend of ours, Luke Erickson. Luke is the executive pastor for Mountain Christian Church. One thing I really appreciate about Luke is his passion for the Bible which is amazing for today's topic because today we're talking about the Bible. What is the Bible? Can we trust it? What's it all about? If you are someone who reads the Bible regularly or even someone who has never read the Bible at all, I think you will find this conversation extremely helpful and enlightening. We get into all sorts of questions regarding how the Bible came to be, the challenge of contradictions within the Bible, and much, much more. If you're like me, you might want to re-listen and take notes on some of what Luke teaches us. Let's get right into our conversation. Hey friends, welcome back on to The Walk. It's good to have you here. I am sitting across the table right now from the one and only Luke Erickson. Mm. Luke, how you doing? I am great. That sounded like really important. (laughs) <laughs> the one and only. Uh, yeah, I don't know. You about are. That. I mean, there's probably some other Luke Erickson. Well, I, I could there. say you're the one and only Gil Shelsby, but not. you're not. Yeah. yeah, there's more of you. I am Gil Shelsby the third for okay. the reference. Um, I know at least two others. Luke, it's good to have you. A lot of you guys who are listening will recognize Luke's voice and probably know Luke just from Sunday mornings and the ways he's involved with our community here at Mountain through preaching. He serves as our executive pastor, so many of you will know him from that. But today, we're going to have a conversation about what is the Bible. One of the things I realized as we kind of set up this conversation is it's one that you and I are probably not disinterested in. It's mm-hmm. kind of one that's flown out of many conversations, even, even as I've you know hung in your office and we've yeah. talked about a lot of this stuff. So we're excited to get to get to do that today. So, man, there's there's a lot of reasons why this question is important. What is the Bible? The Bible seems to always be involved in some sort of whether it's a moral thing or mm-hmm. a historical question. There's a lot of people I think right now there are have a lot of questions about what is the nature of this book that's mm-hmm. been handed down to us. Mm-hmm. And so really really basically I say let's just let's just jump in. Mm-hmm. What is the Bible? Yes. Well, I have a place that we can start and then we can see where we want to go from there. It's a it's a big question. Won't be able to do justice to all of it, but we could get started and point to some other resources. Let me round four bases to get started and maybe talking to a person who even if they have some experience with the bible it would be good to kind of establish these four things and if it's someone who doesn't have much experience with it let's just get oriented everyone recognizes the bible is a book right it looks like a book it's bound like a book and so we bring some of those expectations to it like i never really love to read books and i still reading isn't always my favorite thing sure but I know my daughter doesn't like to read books, so but she knows what to do with the book. You get a book and you open up to page one and you start reading. And so you have some of those expectations you might bring to the Bible. And if you do that, it could get off to a really good start. But, you know, you're going to get not too far in and it could end up being frustrating mm-hmm. if you don't deal with this first question of like, what is the Bible? What is this thing that I've got my hands on? Mm-hmm. So four things to maybe get started and give a framework for that. The first thing is just to say the Bible is a library. So right there, you're moving from the concept of book to a mm-hmm. collection of books. It's a bunch of books on a bookshelf. I've gone to, when I've done teaching recently, putting the Bible bookshelf up as a visual image, just to remind people and reinforce people of the fact that this isn't a book like you typically get off the shelf 
today in that there was lots of authors writing over the course of centuries, many different voices all coming together. And it is unified now and bound it's, is this thing that we call the Holy Bible. Mm -hmm. But it's really better thought of as a library. And there are different books on the shelf. And there are different styles of writing. Just like if you're at Barnes & Noble, there are different genres. Mm -hmm. And those signs are up. And the same kind of thing is true. So getting oriented to some of that uh, helps you know what you're reading. And that conditions your expectations when you even get into it. So mm -hmm. it's not just a book. It's a library of books. That would be one thing. Mm -hmm. The second thing is pretty obvious too. Most people probably understand there are two main sections and in our, our Bibles, our Protestant Bibles, we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. Old Testament is the majority. It's about three quarters of the whole thing, right? 66 books in all, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. And so the Old Testament unfolds and comes to an end and it kind of ends on this cliffhanger. And then the New Testament opens up and begins with the story of Jesus. And it shows how the Old Testament was leading to him. And I think it's pretty common for people to have more trouble with the Old Testament than the New Testament. Sure. A lot of people have probably given advice like, hey, if you're picking up the Bible, start with Jesus. And, and that's, that's pretty good mm -hmm. advice. And you get to Jesus. The interesting thing is like when you open up to the first page of the New Testament, what does it say? Hey, this is the genealogy of Jesus the son of David, mm -hmm. the son of Abraham. So immediately right there. <laughs> you got to turn back. Yeah. Yes, you got this link. And you can go forward with the Jesus story and you don't have to know all about David and Abraham right away. But it does give you the indication that this New Testament thing is very much attached to the Old Testament and is growing out of that and carrying that forward. So you got two sections. Maybe the Old Testament is more foreign than the New Testament. Jesus you know, yes, strikes people in very compelling ways. And I would want people to focus on Jesus. At the same time, the rest of the Bible story is there for a reason too. And Jesus helps us find our way there. Mm -hmm. So that would be the second one. The, the third one, and I've alluded to this already, is just to say the Bible has a plot. And it's a big one. <laughs> we've, we've talked about this some before, mm -hmm. Gil. The Bible is claiming to tell the story of the world. You recommended a book to me Kevin Rowe's book, Christianity mm -hmm. Surprise. I like the way he said it. It's the story of everything. Yeah. That is a great phrase. Cool. It's telling the story of everything. It's making a claim on reality. It's saying this is the way things are. And it's not answering every question, but what it does give to us is really compelling. And I think like any good plot, it, it builds, it has a plot tension, it introduces you know, you could say the problem or the problems that we all feel and we can certainly relate to the stories that it telling the big story that it's giving to us and characters are developed and they somehow carry the, the plot forward and drive toward its resolution. They do that quite imperfectly. That's one of the things you notice as soon as you get in to the Bible. And it all is moving in a very distinct direction. It's moving toward Jesus. And it's, well, it's a lot of different things. It's tragedy, it's comedy, it's, it's hopeful, it's drama for sure. And I like a friend of mine, Buddy Coffee, who's part of this church. He talks about the Bible, the Old Testament in particular, as the family story. And I like thinking of it that way because every, every family has a story that they tell. And the, the plot of the Old Testament in particular, it starts very broad, like creation, and everything was created and made. And then very quickly, it gets narrow. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, the good thing that was created unwinds and is distorted in tons of very awful ways. And it ends, the, the, and Genesis 11 ends with all of the nations of the earth kind of living in rebellion and doing their own thing, not according to the design of the creator. So God responds. He introduces himself into the plot in a very distinct way. So it narrows really quickly to this one family, Abraham, and through you, I'm going to bless your family and all nations of the earth will be blessed. God is involving himself and the story to bless all nations, to get back what's been lost. And so that's a pretty important plot point that is then driving forward throughout the story of the Bible and leads to, you know, the, this hope and longing for something to, to bring it to a resolution. So mm -hmm. the family story idea and getting toward the New Testament, the New Testament reflects back on the idea of family and says, family isn't about just your bloodline or even behaving and being part of this ethnic group or behaving with these customs and those kind of things. 
plenty of times throughout history and plenty of times still today, we say, oh, no, what counts to be in this family is like, you got to measure up to this pedigree or these expectations or whatever. And the New Testament is very clear that says, no, what matters about being in this family is regardless of what nation you come from, you can be grafted into the family story. And so this story that starts with Abraham can be your story, Mm -hmm. your family story. So that brings me back to why I like what Buddy's saying so much is that no matter who you are, here we are, just two guys on this other side of the world now, Mm -hmm. thousands of years later, we can claim that as our family story. And it moves, again, as we've said, very imperfectly through messiness and lots of ugly stuff and things that you'd be embarrassed about, but also some very redemptive things Mm -hmm. too that God works through these these creatures to bring about the kinds of resolution that God wants and the mm-hmm. kinds of intentions that God has for his creation. So it has a plot. That's a that's a big one. I get excited about that and I like yeah. diving into that and and seeing how it unfolds. And I've already alluded to the the fourth thing to just say Jesus is the center. It all is driving toward Jesus. It's moving in that direction the longing that is building throughout all of the twists and turns of the Old Testament is left unfulfilled. When the book closes on the Old Testament, we, we don't know. It's a little bit disorienting. We're waiting for God to act on the ways that God has promised to act. And that's when the New Testament opens. And as we've said, it's introducing, it's throwing out to the center of the stage Jesus, the the son of David, the son of Abraham, yes. And he comes from a very distinct place for a very distinct purpose. And Jesus is making some very large claims that he is the fulfillment of the story, that he's the center of everything, that he's the foundation of reality, that Jesus is the truest picture of God, that Jesus is the truest picture of what it means to be human. I mean, those are really large claims. And well, that's that's what we're being invited to to interact with and to respond to that Jesus is the solution and the resolution that uh, we're all longing for. And you can see why then the the Bible's invitation is to make Jesus the center of our lives, right? Mm -hmm. That's so this is not just some detached story, like a nice thing that you read and put down and go on Mm -hmm. with your life. No, this is a story that is making a claim on your own story. So Mm -hmm. that's the, the wonder of the Bible is that when it has the intended effect, Mm -hmm. it influences your own story, your story intersects with it. And then, you know, that's when everything changes and you you can go on the journey that that God has designed. Mm -hmm. You can be the human that you were created to be if Mm -hmm. you know Jesus, the fully God and fully human one. So rounding those four bases is maybe just a place to start and trying to say, well, what is the Bible? Yeah. So yeah, if you are listening, go back and just hit rewind on that. Probably oh. <laughs> it's a good, it's a good idea. <laughs> I go too fast. The last no, that's okay. amazing. Really, really good stuff. Yeah, I I think the reason why I find like this thing so helpful. So to to recap, you just said a couple of things. One, the Bible is a library mm-hmm. rather than maybe just one book. There are two main sections: the Old Testament and the New. It's a family story. Mm-hmm. Jesus is at the center of this mm-hmm. story. The reason why I find that so compelling and amazing is because I, th- I think a lot of the times we come to the Bible with mm. kind of our own expectations for how mm. it should behave based off of maybe how we've read other books or something like that. Mm-hmm. And as you know, like that can lead to, I think, a lot of maybe misconceptions sure. about what the Bible is and confusions and a lot of, a lot of different things. I, I don't know. What, what do you sense as far as like, what have you seen as far as how that's taken shape? Like sure. people, maybe what are some misconceptions, yeah. ways that we maybe understand, mm-hmm. misunderstand the story? Well, and the first thing that occurs to me after going through all that, like you're acknowledging, we, there are some misconceptions and it might just be a word to say, hey, give yourself some grace. Mm-hmm. That, that's a lot. When you do open the Bible mm-hmm. and you look, I mean, the one I got is like 1,200 pages, right? Mm-hmm. Depending on how it was printed. That's a lot. I don't read other books that have 1,200 pages. I don't read collections of ancient literature outside of that or all the different kinds of literature. There's, there's just a diverse uh, set of literature it, it, contained within it. So give yourself some grace. It's meant to be a lifelong journey as you get into mm-hmm. it. And if you've got some misconceptions, like it's okay. It doesn't mean the Bible it doesn't hold value for you or that God hasn't worked through your life, yeah. worked in your life as a result of your interactions with the Bible. But I've just noticed a few things. The, others have observed these things too. There's nothing like super scientific about my assessments here, but here, here's some things that I, I've seen people 
tend to go to the Bible with some assumptions like, well, it's a theological dictionary. It's primarily for information, like doctrinal stuff and mm -hmm. building that. And plenty of people, when they talk about the Bible, they outline these specific points of doctrine. And of course, it does contain that. You can build those kinds of ideas, but that's not fundamentally what it is. Some treat it like a devotional grab bag, you might call it. I think what often when you have this assumption, what you often do then is just get little bits and pieces of the Bible grabbing, you know, the verses that we paint on the wall that we tattoo on our arm. And th those are fine things. I hope that there are little snippets of the Bible that are super meaningful for mm -hmm. people. And God can speak through those things. It's just to say that's not all the Bible is. It's, it's not just this little, well, let me just dip in, flip to a page, grab a nice verse that encourages me and warms my heart and go on my way. If it does that, fine, but there's more going on there. Similarly, a life handbook with quips and quotes and hacks. We Google for these things now, you know, quotes about whoever, whatever famous people said, yeah. like it's just a collection of those kinds of things or the, you know, basic instructions before leaving earth kind of acronym sure. that you've probably heard that before. <laughs> it's lacking. It does give instruction. And although it's not very basic, I mean, in some ways it is basic, but yeah. it's also very complex and intricate and nuanced and profound and you know, we won't even talk about the leaving earth thing right now, but well, I would imagine too, like if the, if what you just said about the Bible being a family story mm -hmm. that stretches over, like it has a narrative arc to it, like yeah. it's going somewhere, sure. then maybe to pull out like just little quotes and little bits and pieces is in some way to miss the larger part of the story, wouldn't you say? Yes, I agree. You could take a movie quote and just pull it out and I guess make it mean whatever you want. I mean, mm -hmm. you're doing something akin to that if you are just totally disregarding wherever you got this thing from in the Bible and plucking it out. Again, you might be using it in the way that it was intended. God might be speaking to you in a profound way through it. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. I'm just saying it's not fundamentally what the Bible is. It's not a recipe book. It's, okay, what's the recipe for being successful in business? What's the recipe for being a good parent? What's the recipe for what it means to be a leader? Those are all good questions. And the Bible can give some light on that, but it's not just giving me those formulas. I do understand those things and I get perspective on those things as I immerse myself in the story. And as I listen to what God is saying through it, but it's just not formatted and designed to be that. It's not a magic spell book either. Like, mm -hmm. okay, what are the magical things that I need to uh -huh. do, the <laughs> protocols that I need to go through in order to get whatever magic blessing that other people seem to have because right. they keep giving God credit for their blessings in their life and I don't <laughs> seem to have it. So what are they doing in the, like, how do I mine this out of the Bible mm -hmm. and get these magic spells to apply to me, I think that we bring those assumptions. Or the last one I'll mention is just to say it's a rule book. That might be the most common one mm -hmm. when people have their idea that it's all about the morality. And morality is, of course, critically important. And the Bible cares a lot about morality and ethics. But it's not just a rule book. It's more diverse than that. It is telling a story. The rules, the guidance, the instruction that it's giving are set within a much larger framework that mm -hmm. is trying to tell a story of the way things are and who you are as a human and how do you function within mm -hmm. that. And then so out of that larger framework, yes, there are certain expectations and a calling for what it means to live up to that view of what it means to be human. So if you bring some of those expectations to the Bible, I guess the reason to note those and to try to course correct those is because you could be disappointed. So mm -hmm. if you are expecting it to speak in like these doctrinal, very black and white or, you know, rigid kinds of ways, you're going to probably be disappointed when you're reading poetry or even when you're mm -hmm. reading a story that is very messy in its details. You're reading, I mean, through a really difficult book like Judges, where mm -hmm. there's lots of blood and war and violence and these, I don't know, I'll say heroes in quotes, like someone like Samson or Gideon or mm -hmm. are are they heroes? Are, 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 am I supposed to just emulate them mm -hmm. exactly? Or what, what am I supposed to do? They don't seem to have very solid moral character sure, in yeah. a lot of ways. Even Abraham, Abraham has his amazing high points and he's very faithful in what he's doing. And then he has some times where he goes the way that we all go. And he's like, oh, I got a better idea. And it, you know, blows up in his face. And mm -hmm. so if you bring the wrong expectations to it, you're expecting that everyone that's held up is, oh, I just, I'm just supposed to emulate their life. Like it's just giving me that moral instruction. Well, it is, but you got to understand what, mm -hmm. the, what the difference is.
And if you're just looking for quips and quotes, you're cherry picking stuff and you're not really acknowledging what, what is God really trying to do Mm -hmm. with this? In in that case, just Google stuff and you can find whatever Confucius says or whoever, you know, what's to say that this thing is actually jiving with reality. Mm -hmm. So I just, we got to pay attention to what some of our assumptions are and just work to get better ones. That's so helpful. I think too, sometimes we come to the Bible and we're a little intimidated by Mm -hmm. getting either interpreting it right or getting the, the history of it right or being theologically correct or something like that. Yeah. And I think a lot of this stuff kind of removes a little bit of that pressure to say, mm-hmm. you just come to the Bible humbly and, and ask yourself, where do I fit in the story of God that mm-hmm. it's, it's throwing in front of my face? It takes a little bit of the pressure off to, yeah. to interpret it right or do the right thing or that sort of thing. Another thing I might add, just the idea that the Bible wasn't written to me. Mm-hmm. It is for me. Okay. It is very useful, in fact, indispensable, I think, mm. to guide us in, in life. But it wasn't written to me. And so there's a lot of people, the way they behave with, with the Bible, even if you're in like a small group study, it's like, all right, we would just read something and we go around and say, well, what does that mean to you? Mm. And, and yes, we do have to get to that question. What does it mean to you? What is this saying? What claims is this making on my life and how I'm going to go live and be a man and a husband and a father and so forth? But there are other questions to ask first. We don't want to just skip over and pretend like, oh, this is just God's book from heaven directly to me as if nothing else exists. So let's just be thoughtful about the ways that we handle it, kind of honor some of the layers that are there, and then work within the context of a loving community, Mm -hmm. uh, seek God's wisdom. And there's a lifelong nature to that. And so again, patience and grace with yourself. Not trying to say you got to be some scholar before you can get any value mm-hmm. out of the Bible at all. That's not true. And mm-hmm. at the same time, it doesn't mean we don't keep striving and look for wisdom and try to ask the right questions. Yeah. So just, let me ask you this: What if I'm if the question for me when I sit down with a Bible and maybe I'm by myself, maybe I'm in a small group, if the question for me is not what is the Bible saying about my life in this exact moment right now? When you're approaching the Bible, maybe as a community or as an individual, what are maybe the, if there are the right questions or like, mm-hmm. what are the questions we ask of the text when we come to it? Maybe let's say as, as mm-hmm. a Christian community. Mm-hmm. Well, I think in general, the first one is what, what did it mean? Mm-hmm. What was the writer trying to communicate before I'm asking what it means for me right now, there's a whole set of questions that have to do with, well, what was the original intent? How was this word from God through this human author to this intended audience? Well, what if, what was it for? Why was it spoken in the first place? I mean, we write stuff now because we have a sense of what we're trying to accomplish. Something needs to be said. Well, at various points in history that are recorded for us, God was trying to communicate something to his people. And he chose the the distinct ways that he's done and it's collected in the Bible. So just like, let's get a sense of who are these people? What were their circumstances? Where are they coming from? Where are they going to? How Mm -hmm. does this particular word make a difference in that? How does it continue the plot that's being developed? Or if it's, you know, understanding the kind of literature that it is, if it's a poetry, poetry or a song or a parable or a proverb or it's narrative history or it's a letter that's being written, you know, just those are some questions that shouldn't be just reserved to like nerdy scholarly people. Mm-hmm. Okay. Nerdy scholars can help us regular people yeah. get a sense of that's those the things. Of it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then, oh, okay, I can get some sense of mm-hmm. like that's what was going on there. And then I can thoughtfully within community, prayerfully begin to make the associations to, okay, if that was true of that situation, where do I recognize some corollaries in my situation and the, the, where I find myself in the community and the challenges that we face and the questions that we're asking? Maybe there's some of the same questions. Maybe they are facing some of the same pressures or wrestling through some things that we can really relate to. Maybe it's very foreign and I just got to keep working and I get through it and it's like, well, that seemed to be really important for them. God, you're just going to have to teach me how that's sure. important for me. <laughs> for now, I'm just going to keep going and keep pursuing you and keep learning with humility. And sometimes the Bible's like that. It's not going to be like, oh, that was just the inspiration I needed exactly for that day every time. doesn't mean the Bible doesn't have value. It just let it be what it's trying to be and be a good student of it.
shifting gears okay. a little bit. Is the Bible relevant <laughs> today? Why should I care about what it says? Well, I ask myself that a lot. I don't want to be believing a lie. I don't want to be living a lie. I want my life to be patterned after something that isn't real. I'm trying to walk in touch with reality. And it's obvious to me that the general assumptions about who Christians are or who the people that read the Bible probably the general assumptions are that those people are out of touch with reality, that stay away from the Bible because it will distort your sense of what's real and true. So I'm not persuaded by that. I wonder sometimes, and I'm skeptical of my own conclusions a lot, and I'm trying to see, do they hold up? The shortest answer to that question, is the Bible so relevant, why should I even care about what it says, is Jesus. Okay? And Jesus and everything that he is, and his life and death and his resurrection, most importantly. 1 Corinthians 15, of course, is probably the best place to understand the significance of the resurrection. And the claim that's being made there is, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then everything that we're doing here is just worthless. We should be pitied because we are believing a lie. We are out of step with the way things are. But if this story that began, that claims to begin at creation, when God ordered the chaos and brought things into being, and chose Abraham as uh, ultimately the answer to what ails us. If Jesus is carrying that forward when he's making all of these crazy claims about who he is, and if he then rose from the dead to validate that identity, then I'm paying attention to that. So ultimately, I still pay attention to the Bible because I do believe it bears witness to things that are true. Not just like doctrinal statements that are true. I believe, first of all, that it bears witness to actual things that happened. Principally, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. It's the events that happened in real history that gave birth to a community that just a bunch of people around responding to, oh my goodness, this happened. Now what? The events gave birth to a community, which then gave us the book that we have, which is the Bible. Mm -hmm. I believe the testimony that is contained in the Bible of those witnesses that they're saying, oh, we saw it. And then they're connecting all kinds of dots about what's true and what's real and what's right and what's mm -hmm. good. I accept that testimony. And so why the Bible? Well, if I want to pursue myself what's good and right and true and best, then I think the Bible makes an important contribution mm. to that pursuit. In fact, I think it makes an essential contribution to that pursuit. I don't think that I'm going to arrive at those goals or, or experience those kinds of realities without going in the direction that the Bible points me, mm -hmm. me as an individual. And I would say for the world, if I'm looking out or just as my community or the world community on the world stage, I mean, ultimately, I... Yeah, I believe that if the world is going to realize it, that my community is going to realize what's good and right and true, and that is the life that is truly life, then the way that the Bible is pointing us, the light that the Bible is shining on our situation, I believe we need to walk in that light. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that there, you know, there isn't great cultural distance between the original writers mm -hmm. and my culture? Well, of course there is. Sure. Does that mean that I'm not going to have this experience where I read something in the Bible, I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Uh -huh. Or have this experience like, that's dead wrong. Like, that does not square with my understanding of what is ethically right. Wait, so you're saying, if you feel that way... It's normal. It's normal, Of yeah. course you're going to yeah. experience. Now, there's plenty that you're going to read in the Bible that go, oh my, that rings true. Yeah. That is beautiful. I want to live into that. And I have no trouble transporting from that original context to my context and just like my heart sings because mm -hmm. that's exactly mm -hmm. the way that I would want it to be said. Mm -hmm. and, it, and the reverse is also going to be true because the Bible was written in a foreign place, in a foreign context. It's, you know, there's great cultural distance. Now, that gap can be bridged mm -hmm. thoughtfully and carefully as someone who is trying to bridge that gap all the time, I would say it doesn't remove all tensions. Mm -hmm. It doesn't erase all complexities. It doesn't answer every question. That's part of why it's a lifelong journey. And there are some places where I just, I still have questions. We've talked maybe about the violence in the Bible. And mm -hmm. there are some things that I can say in response to that. There is some sense that I can make of the larger story and the way that the violence in the Bible is kind of set within the context of the larger arc of scripture. There are, I can get some help with that, mm -hmm. but I don't know that I can reconcile that 
completely. And I'm, I'm guess I'm guided by this this principle: faith seeking understanding, and understanding seeking faith. That is to say that there are going to be some times when my understanding, the things I think I know and that I've learned, and the questions that I'm asking outpaces the faith that I have. That's an angsty thing. I do not like living sure, yeah. in that space. I think the older that you get, the more you deal with the complexities of life, you get more accustomed to it. And you understand that that's natural. In those places, I ask for the faith to kind of catch up to my understanding. And then there are times when my faith like outpaces my understanding and the things that I know and the, the questions that I have that, that I'm asking that I've learned. And in those times, I ask for wisdom to live in accordance, to live out the, the faith that I have and to keep learning more and growing into maturity and so forth. So I would like it, I, I think we would all be better off if we just expect that to be a normal part of the ways that mm -hmm. we interact with the Bible. Faith seeking understanding, understanding seeking faith. That will probably be a daily experience for some of us, like when our questions outpace our faith. Mm -hmm. there, there's going to be periods like that. And there will be maybe whole seasons like that. And I've been through those mm -hmm. seasons where particularly in my early 20s, when I'm trying to figure out, like, I'm not going to church anymore because my parents are making me. I get to decide which, which way am I going to direct my life. And just living with that tension of, wow, the questions that I have are like way outpacing the mm -hmm. faith that I have. So I can jump ship and I can throw the Bible out and discard it, say it's not relevant, say, no, I, I have no use for the Bible. Mm -hmm. Or I can continue to move toward God in that and really try to see what, what is God trying to teach me here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it means my understanding of the Bible needs to be reframed. I need to just get better at the, the tools that I have mm -hmm. and the questions that I'm asking of the text so that it can tell me what it wants to tell me. And sometimes that resolves some of the tension, sometimes all of the tension, sometimes I got to keep going. So that's just the it's just the way it goes when you're trying to learn the family story and live the family story in all of its complexities, because life is complex. And I think the beautiful thing about the Bible is that it acknowledges that complexity. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people's approach to dealing with the, you know, the angst or the, the, the complexity of life is to say, oh, look at the Bible. It's so simple. It irons everything out. It's all black and white and really simple. And like, I don't think that's what the Bible is yeah. offering us. I don't think that's the way to resolve that tension. Uh, so I've gone off on that a little bit, but did I answer your question? No, that's great. Okay. <laughs> that's great. That's really good. I think it's comforting for a lot of people, a lot of us as we kind of, yeah, read the Bible and are maybe in one of those seasons of wrestling through some hard questions and yeah. can't seem to figure out exactly sure. where to land on it. So I think that's, that's really good for a lot of us who are mm. in that place. You mentioned a couple of things that I want to press into a little bit deeper. So there's a little bit of distance between us sitting at this table in 2023 sure. and say, you know, Israelite scribes in, you know, 1300 BC or whatever mm -hmm. it might be. But I think one of the critiques of the Bible right now is that it's just not even that it's a relevant thing, but it's, you know, it's a really ancient old book. Can mm -hmm. we trust a series of documents or books or letters or whatever that was written by ancient people mm -hmm. that long ago mm -hmm. how can it still hold up sort of thing yeah i've noticed that some people try to answer that question i think by emphasizing the divinity of the bible like and, and i have i'm going to say with full assurance their full conviction that the bible is inspired by mm -hmm. god i yes that's what it claims about itself and i take that to be true mm -hmm. And so it originates from God. It, it, the, the God that made the world is somehow expressing God's self through the Bible. I believe that. The trouble, I th think, with that emphasis is that sometimes it leads to a conception of the Bible like it just fell from heaven in this pristine mm. form. And that's the way that God communicated what God wanted to communicate. The Bible, several places, comments on the ways that it was constructed and put together. And That's we right, know yeah. that it was lots of authors coming together over centuries and, and stitching this thing together in very intricate ways. So the Bible is very comfy with that idea. And I've grown to be very comfy with that idea. So my answer to the way that I would respond to questions about the Bible's authority is not to just immediately kind of hide it behind some, you know, divine fell from heaven kind mm -hmm. of idea. I have actually grown in my appreciation of God and just wonder of who God is 
by recognizing just how human the Bible is. Mm -hmm. In fact, the way God works in the world mm -hmm. is embodied through humans. God has never been shy about that, never been worried about that. I mean, yeah. go to the first page of the Bible when God creates humans as mm -hmm. his icons, his representatives, the very image of the God of the universe mm -hmm. is now somehow packaged in this, you know, dirt creature that mm -hmm. has the animating breath of life, the breath of God in him and them as male and female. So that's on the first page of the Bible. It seems to be pretty much in the design of the way God created the world. And mm -hmm. that's consistent with how God continues to show up in the world, like in these embodied ways. So I don't know, like when you read in the first parts of Genesis, when it's like God having a conversation with Abraham, and then God said, and Abraham did, and then God said, or, you know, God talks that way to Moses and so forth. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that was like. Sure. I, I can't say that I've had those experiences. I don't sweat that too much or you know when a prophet uh, Isaiah or Jeremiah you know claims to have a word from God I mean Jeremiah is describing like I've got the word of God like as a fire in my bones I can't not get it out I can relate actually a little bit to sure. that experience feeling like oh, something that God is is wanting to convey is like coming through me it's like being birthed in me and has to come out so I don't, I don't know all the mechanics of that, but I'm very comfortable recognizing the human fingerprints on the Bible. And to me, that lends more authority to it, to think that God mm -hmm. could accommodate God's self mm -hmm. to the world through humans and let all of these messed up humans get, to the, get their hands on this thing that is telling a story that has implications for the whole cosmos and th that it could be portrayed and handed down through generations and mm -hmm. subject to the, the sin and the awfulness and everything that we're capable of mm -hmm. that is anti-God. The fact that God lets that into our hands mm -hmm. and somehow still delivers something beautiful and compelling and convicting and shines some kind of light through that. I just I mean, there's times when it just floors me, like I'm getting yeah. to the end of what I can even conceive mm -hmm. when I'm just amazed by that. And so, and that's just, a, I guess, a nice story unless Jesus, mm -hmm. okay? Because when I get to Jesus and the story of Jesus is introduced with Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and then when Jesus attaches himself to this story. So I guess, ultimately, when you're saying, okay, ancient authors, how could I trust them? Well, on the one hand, I'm not just like evaluating their character, or like, you right. know, can I trust them? I'm, I'm trusting Jesus, who points to that story being told and says, that is the best description of what's happening in the world, what God the Creator is doing. And I'm trusting Jesus, and I'm trusting Jesus' resurrection, and I'm trusting the, the giving of the Spirit, which is now present, and Jesus is embodied through His Spirit in the church, and that is bearing witness and has given me these texts, which I call the Bible. So I'm kind of layering the authority there. I mean, mm -hmm. I am ultimately believing Jesus is who He says He is. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, I do trust these ancient authors. Like a thought experiment, if someone were to tell you where you work and they, they came to work and they said, oh, this morning I was reading some ancient Egyptian literature or some ancient Babylonian As you do. literature. As you, you do. Know. Yeah, yeah, you know, just <laughs> there in, in my quiet time and just reading it. And I just, wow, I just really felt like it was giving me insights for my day and how I should act. And like, I, I thought God was warming my heart through that. And I just, I'm learning a lot about that culture. And, you know, even though it was thousands of years ago, I just feel like it's speaking with a relevance today. I mean, you, no, people don't do that. I yeah. mean, you know, I read Greek stuff, Greek epics and humanities class, right. which I hated in college. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and, and all of those ancient cultures, the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Egyptians, they all had their own epic tales of how they were constructing reality. And they all had gods that they associated with certain acts and certain power and all of that. And if Jesus came and showed up mm -hmm. and said, I am here to carry forward the story of Amon Re, or I'm here to carry forward the story of Marduk, okay? And, and when you see me, you're, everything about what Marduk claims is actually the case, and mm -hmm. here's my resurrection to prove it. That would speak. That would, that would testify in a way sure. that I would have to pay attention to because, I, I mean, I'm listening to Jesus because he came back from the dead, and mm -hmm. I, I don't know others who have done that. I mean, that, that's really, again, the linchpin of it because it doesn't make any sense. When you, go, when you show up to work, you say, yeah, this morning I woke up and I had a quiet time. I got some coffee and was sitting you know, in my nice chair yeah. and I was reading this ancient <laughs> Hebrew literature from people on the other side of the world, centuries, like, who, who does, why in the world would yeah. you do that? 
So again, it's a long way of saying it's about Jesus because of what Jesus claims. And I'm looking at Jesus and I'm compelled by who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And I don't know another way to account for what has happened among us mm -hmm. with what's developed in and through the church and in, in the world. That all traces itself back mm -hmm. to Jesus and the, the power of the resurrection and the giving of the spirit. So I'm, I'm compelled by that story yeah. and I find myself trying to live it out. In some ways, yeah, there's nothing quite like it, even in the ancient world that makes right. a claim quite like that, that's right. living and active and something we can participate in. I think it's, that's a, that's a beautiful thing. I think mm -hmm. it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Before we wrap up, I want to, I want to touch on something real quick that I think is, is one, just one extra thing. I think a lot of us are still puzzled about just the idea of contradictions mm. in the Bible, like Set aside the Bible's ancient, it's relevant, whatever. Like, what about the moments in the Bible where it seems like you have authors disagreeing with one another, or even God, I don't know, changing his mind or thinking sure. differently in different parts of the Bible? What do we do with a book that seems to contradict itself? How do we trust something like that? Yeah. Well, there's, there's a lot to explore here. And we, we, to do a real valuable study, we'd probably want to go to each of those contradictions and really wrestle through them. And I would just affirm that effort. That maybe is the first point is to say, when you encounter those things, dig in and explore. Let that be a move toward the Bible. Let that be a move toward God. I've noticed plenty of people who just want to say a comment like that. Oh, there's plenty of contradictions mm -hmm. in the Bible. And then they just dismiss it and walk away. And I don't think that's a responsible move. I don't think that yeah. reflects someone who's honestly pursuing what's true. The Bible is very aware that those exist <laughs> within itself. I mean, the authors that put it together, and, and again, that's a spirit-guided process. That's what we would understand that, that God has done. So I, I just would hope that somebody could let that, the recognition of those things, I'll say contradictions, and sometimes I kind of say contradictions in quotes. All right? sure. they, they, they seem that way to us on the surface. Mm -hmm. Let that be a way to move you toward and to mm -hmm. dig in and pursue God. As we record this, you know, we, we're going through this series on Proverbs, right? Mm -hmm. And Proverbs, you, you'd say, is maybe wisdom literature. And the kind of framework that it operates on is, is basically this. If you follow God, life will work out well for you. And that's basically true, mm -hmm. I, I think. <laughs> and there's a lot of things I could point to in my life where when I'm doing life God's way, life does unfold in a way that works pretty well. And like tangible results of, you, you could just say health and wealth and those, you know, those sure. kinds of things, good happiness, those kinds of things. And Proverbs spells those out. And that's the, the basic uh, operating principle in Proverbs. Well, I think anybody who's lived knows that that's not the way that life that's always right. works. And you know what? The Bible knows that too. And I've found so much, I guess, healing and comfort. I've found my voice in the voices of the Bible. Mm -hmm. Whether you're talking about Job, who says, hold on a second. That's right. <laughs> uh, that, 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 life is not working out like that for me. And of course, then the the part of the literary art of Job is Job's conversation with his friends who are totally operating by that principle. Yeah. And they're saying, they're basically quoting Proverbs to him, right? Exactly. <laughs> like Job, we know how life works. You clearly don't. And, and Job holds on. Of course, mm -hmm. what the, those friends don't know, like we're led into this, this scene at the beginning of Job of like mm -hmm. that, where God is acknowledging Job's righteousness and mm -hmm. like, the friends are blind to that, but we as the readers know that. And, and so we're just wrestling and we don't get a nice tidy answer to that. Mm -hmm. It's not like, a, oh, well, I see everything happens for a reason and I see why. And mm -hmm. here's all the redemptive things that we we know. And I mean, there's still a lot of angst that you co come away from that story with or the, the many Psalms that are crying out to God because mm -hmm. life just sucks. And we're being honest about that. And that's a good pattern for us when we experience the pain of life. The, the psalm writers move toward God. They don't just throw it all away and say, well, God can't be real because I have this pain in my life. They're saying, I, I'm somehow, even though it doesn't make sense, I'm holding on to this conviction that God is real and I'm, an address, I'm addressing a God that I can't see and that doesn't seem to be responding right now, that is leaving me in the dark, but I'm grasping for, you know, shouting into the darkness, waiting for the light mm -hmm. to dawn. And, and sometimes the psalm ends with just, 
darkness like Psalm 88 does. That's right, yeah. And sometimes the psalmist can bring themselves, in fact, oftentimes they bring themselves to turn and praise God, even in the midst of unanswered questions or the contradictions mm -hmm. of life, but sometimes not. And, you know, you, you, we just, we don't know and wait for the Lord, mm -hmm. take heart and wait for the Lord. And that's kind of the, the way it ends for us sometimes, that's right, or yeah. that's the guidance we get in any moment. So I think those kinds of ways, you know, so just to say life is full of tensions, the Bible knows that. And if there are places of contradiction, just a few things to say without maybe citing any specific examples, which you, which you need to study. The Bible is a book of multiple perspectives. We've mm -hmm. cited some of those. The writer of Proverbs, the writer of Job, they're coming from different places and somehow those exist in the same Bible. The Bible's not troubled by that. God's not troubled by that. Mm -hmm. There is a transmission history, right? Mm -hmm. There is there, there is translations and that would be a whole set of podcasts and study sure. on, and people do that. Like they nerd out on that kind of stuff of the, the manuscripts that were developed and copies of copies and copies and errors were made just like they would. And, mm -hmm. and again, somehow... God is, is honoring that process and saying, my spirit is somehow present there and I am working through this process of transmission to communicate what wow, needs to be communicated yeah. to the world. Now, you can be someone like Bart Ehrman who just says, oh, well, the, the presence of these errors just means that the whole thing is a charade and yeah. I'm, I'm throwing it all out. I don't think that that conclusion has to follow mm -hmm. from the fact that there's a transmission history and when one copyist wrote it this way and one copyist wrote it this way. I mean, the, the essential things it is speaking with a unified and compelling voice. Mm -hmm. So we can pay attention to any of those particular things, but just understand that those are there. And the answer to the, the presence of those facts is not to say, oh, the Bible's perfect, it fell from heaven, those aren't there, I want to cover that up. No, mm -hmm. we can be honest about that. And then to just recognize too, we've said the cultural distance, Genesis 1 operates with a cosmology that's very different from what totally, we've yeah. understood about cosmology now. It's it's comfy with that. Mm -hmm. and. We could talk a lot about Genesis 1 and what it is trying to do and what it isn't trying to do. And so just to back up, when I say the Bible is making a claim on reality, I, that, that doesn't mean that when it's giving an account of the way things are, that doesn't mean that I'm assuming mm -hmm. some simplistic reading of Genesis 1 that says all oh, the earth is, you know, can be dated to a few thousand years old or that you know, the, the dinosaurs didn't exist or, you know, making some kind of claims about whether evolution is real or not, or like mm -hmm. it, I'm, I'm not saying any of that. Okay. We, we should study Genesis one and two and, three, and, and what it is trying to teach. And sometimes when we experience contradictions, I think we should move toward, we should understand what is Genesis one trying to teach us and what is the way in which, what are the assumptions that it's making? What is the world that it's inhabiting? And mm -hmm. out of that, it is communicating a message that I think is still relevant. I mean, I'm convinced that it is still relevant and that it's worth understanding and going forward. So these things that seem to be contradictions sometimes are just like, we're talking past one another. We're asking questions of the text that it just simply isn't trying right, to yeah. answer. And when you can acknowledge that, then things that appeared as contradictions at first get reframed a little bit. Doesn't mean that it erases all tension and there's still some work to do on how do we, you know, what, what do we say with regard to the scientific record and how does that influence how we understand the Bible and all that. But those are good questions. Mm -hmm. We should be thoughtful and we should listen to the wider community of faith who's being thoughtful about these things as well mm -hmm. and work toward greater understanding mm -hmm. as we experience things that we would call a contradiction. So there's a few things and, you know, that, to say nothing of the poetry in the Bible too, which is mm -hmm. you're not trying to build whole doctrines out of, of poetry and just let it be what it's trying to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in some sense, that's like the question of relevance. Like, would the Bible really be relevant if it didn't include things like sure. contradiction, confusion, confusion, mystery, suffering, weakness? All yeah. of that's bottled up there yeah. in the Bible. It's kind of like it's a window into how life yeah. kind of actually works. You look yeah. at the things in our world, it's kind of very similar. So, And it's not to say that it just leaves you like, oh, <laughs> life is confusing, the Bible's confusing, right, yeah. you know, so, so everything's fine. Well, but it does drive toward, it, it holds mm -hmm. up. I, how do you get clearer than a, a human? Like mm -hmm. it, it's pointing to Jesus and Jesus is saying, all right, let me get on your level mm -hmm. in like the most realist way ever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. God is becoming human. Uh -huh. And, and that's so when the advice that comes like, well, just, you know, get to Jesus, if, uh, advice about handling, that, that, okay, yeah, that's good advice. Like mm -hmm. get to Jesus. There's other stuff to understand, but it's all framed within our understanding of Jesus and it, like it does become clear and it shines and it pops and it's compelling. 
and it does give guidance. It does shine light on the path when you are drawn to Jesus and seeing Jesus for who he is. So it, it doesn't leave us in some murky, oh, well, everything's confusing kind of a place. Right, yeah. If you move toward God and to- toward the Bible, and you Story's dig in taking deeper. us somewhere, yeah. Exactly. Just to wrap up and close, if I'm someone who's maybe has some familiarity with the Bible, or maybe I've never even encountered the Bible, and maybe based off of this conversation, I'm wanting to dig a little deeper. Yeah. What would you say to someone who's maybe wants to read the Bible, doesn't know where to start? Where would you, where would you point folks? Yeah, I'll try to be real practical. One is just make some time. If Bible reading is not a part of your rhythm, mm-hmm. you've got to create space for it. Otherwise, it will just be a good idea. So we, we already kind of cast that image of a person who wakes up early and sits alone mm-hmm. in their chair. And that might be something that you do. I'm a morning person. My wife is not. We have very opposite rhythms. That's I don't right. care what your rhythm is. You got to make time, like work it in mm-hmm. and value it. If everything that we're saying is true about the story that God is telling mm-hmm. in the world and the, the fact that that story could make the biggest difference in your story, then mm-hmm. you're going to have to decide to prioritize that and give ear to that story so that it can get into you and influence you in all the ways that God designed. So you got to make some time for it. Secondly, I would say find some people. And for us, that's the church. I think that's God's design. It is the, the community that is the bearer of this story. And that just looks very practically like a, a local community. The Bible was produced by a community, in a community, for a community. And that's where that image that we might have of like sitting alone in your chair with your coffee in the morning, that's not bad. That's fine. But that's not all there is. That, that, that maybe has become like the poster image for us is thinking about Bible engagement. But really, the Bible was meant to be read in community. So do that on your own. And that's fine. That's one of the wonders of living in the era that we do. We have the printing press and now we have digital and all. So that's right, yeah. the Bible is in everybody's lap, in everybody's ear in a, in a way that it hasn't been for most of history. But yet the mission has still gone forward and, and the community has carried it forward. So get with others, do your own Bible reading and then create time. You know, churches might call that small groups or, whether, you know, maybe you have a Sunday school model or whatever. Mm-hmm. Take classes, get in group, read the Bible, read it aloud in community with others. That's how it was read for centuries. The point is get with other people, make time, find people, and then choose a Bible. That's kind of practical, pretty basic as well. We got a lot of different choices in terms of English translations. I have actually, Gil, for about the last four years, my engagement with the Bible has been audio primarily. Wow. All of my reading, quote unquote, reading on my own has been audio. Hmm. That's just been new. I don't know how long I'll keep that up. It's available. Yeah. It's like it existed before four years ago, but for some reason yeah. for me, it's just, you know, it can happen while I'm on a walk. It actually keeps me better focus doing that or even driving and it, it, I'm able to like get my mind tracking with it and kind of get yeah. lost in it. Is and it the Bible so, app? What is that? Yeah, I use the Bible on? app. Okay. Oh, you, cool. Bible Gateway is a good tool, Bible app. And again, so there's different translations. I use the NIV. I've used it, I guess, for a long time. A lot of churches do that. A lot of English speakers use the NIV. NLT, New Living Translation is another common one. There's, mm-hmm. there's tons of them. The Bible app has tons. Download the app would be another thing. Although, you know, this, we could have a whole conversation about <laughs> digital versus analog. There, there is something about holding the Bible and turning pages and just, you know, I mean, there's studies done on what you retain from that sure. and all that. And so I, I do like, I like my Bible that is marked up on every page and I've had various ones throughout my mm-hmm. life, but kind of the one I have now is is still like my Bible, even sure. though I'm listening to the Bible frequently as well. So pick a Bible. You got to get one. Yeah. Use, use the tools that we have. And then a, a reading plan could be, that'd be the last thing, get going with mm-hmm. a, a reading plan. So this is where maybe my plug and, and encouragement for the Bible Project mm-hmm. is. So bibleproject.com is a resource. We can make that available to people. I just, I have so much appreciation for what they produce and confidence in what they produce. I would trust a person's Bible reading journey. I would trust a person's discipleship to to them. I mean, that's a pretty bold statement. I've just been so enriched by what I've encountered. They they have a variety of resources. So I was just talking specifically about Bible project reading plans. So the Bible Mm -hmm. app has, I don't know, a zillion reading plans, right? right? 
So in, in some sense, pick anyone you want and go for it. But I would really steer you toward the Bible Project. I think they're going to give you the right tools to mm-hmm. and, and the right framework with which to navigate the Bible. And that can be everything from a six-day reading plan on the character of God to a one-year-long journey through the Bible. Mm -hmm. And the nice thing about if you do the reading plans embedded in the Bible app from the Bible Project, it will introduce you to videos that they've made, like six-minute animated videos that I just think are are a great resource. They've made videos on all the books of the Bible. So that would be another thing. Anytime you're studying any book of the Bible, you're you're leading a small group, you're in a small group, and you're going to study Philippians. Mm -hmm. Go to YouTube, Google Bible Project, Philippians and just watch their overview video, you know, six, eight minutes long. They've done the work. They've done the work. (laughs) It'll just give you a sense. There's tons of other tools and, you know, we can link some stuff in the show notes and you can go from there. But if I'm just trying to boil it down to here's a place to start, that's what I would say. Yeah, that's great. And of course, we'll we'll attach all that stuff in the show notes. You can click on that Bible project and and many more resources. I think we we covered some ground here, Luke. I'm grateful for you spending some time walking us through this. Of course, it's not an exhaustive list. There are a billion more complexities that sure. comes with this conversation around the Bible. And our hope is to continue to work through that as we have these conversations here and even in our community in groups and that sort of stuff yeah. around Mountain, as many of us are 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 accustomed to doing so. Hopefully this has started something yeah. and what your appetite to mm-hmm. get into the Bible and move toward God, that, that would be the design. Mm-hmm. You know, there's certainly tons more to say, but it's a lifelong process. I'm in the midst of it. You're in the midst of it. And mm-hmm. we're trying to do that together. So come on and yep. join us. If, Let's go. If you're ready. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, Luke, thank you. Thank you. Well, friends, there's plenty more to be said on this topic, I'm sure, but we're so grateful for Luke for sitting down and sharing with us. You know, there was a theologian named Karl Barth who talked about reading the Bible as if we're stepping into a whole new world. I was reminded today in such a fresh way that reading the Bible is not just a static, boring thing that religious people do, but it's an adventure. It asks questions of us, challenges us, and points us to a beautiful story about the world we live in. If you're wanting to dig deeper with any of this stuff, I wanna encourage you once again to do so with others in community. Here at Mountain, our door is always open as you continue exploring your faith. So feel free to reach out anytime and connect. The best way for you to do that is through the email in the show notes. Thanks for joining in and we'll see you next time.